I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. Um, we're still waiting for a couple of people to get access into this textile talk. Today we'll be um, having conversations with four of the artists from one of Sakwa's exhibitions, um, Ebb and Flow, um, and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful presentation. We will be showing that slideshow again at the end of this textile talk, so if you missed it, you'll have another opportunity to see it. While we're waiting for everybody to arrive, I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about Sakwa's new website. We just launched this website in June, and it has probably around 4,000 art quilts now on the site. And one of the things that is a well-kept, not a secret, but something I wanted to share with you is that if you go to sakwa.com and you go to art, there are a lot of different options um, that you will enjoy. So it, under art are, are, of course, our exhibitions. And if you go to current exhibitions, you can see all of the different exhibitions that we current that are global in nature that we currently have traveling and that includes ebb and flow. And if you scroll down, you can see the entire exhibition that was just being shown in the slideshow. If you click on the picture, you get to see it in a much larger view. And if you click on see details underneath, you get to have all of the st statistics along with the artist statement. The other thing that you can do from sakwa.com art is you can browse the collection. And this is what I really enjoy doing. It's a lot of fun. So one of the things that you can do is you can search for one of the artists. So one of the artists who's presenting today is Carol Ann, oops, it helps if I could spell her name, Grotrian. And if you search her name, you can see eight different pieces of her art, and we will be adding to this. And again, clicking through, you get to see a larger view and more information. The other thing we've just added now is if you go to art, browse the collection, there are online galleries that um, are curated in various different ways. And one I wanted to share with you right now is if you go to collection highlights, we're starting to add collections of art quilts from different museums. For instance, here is a gallery of collection highlights from the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. We also have a gallery of quilts that are collection highlights from the International Quilt Museum. And um, we are about to add a gallery of highlights from the National Quilt Museum. So sometime when you have some time to sit and just enjoy art, please check out sakwa.com art browse the collection. All right, um, we now have around 450 people here. Welcome. Um, if you missed the beginning, I am Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. And today we're going to have conversations with four of the artists from a Sakwa exhibition that is called Ebb and Flow. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our corporate sponsors who make the Textile Talks possible. Um, it's just been wonderful to have their support so that we are now able to do these Textile Talks um, for the next 12 months. Um, today we're talking about ebb and flow. I showed you where to find it on the Sakwa website. Um, you can also order a catalog through the store, well, along with a lot of other Sakwa publications, 
um, all about art quilts. We have magazines, we have books, we have catalogs from the other exhibitions. So if you really enjoy looking at art quilts, please check out our store. Um, the four artists that you're going to hear from today are Meredith Grimsley, Carol Ann Grotrian, Marisa Marquez, and Lynn Seaman. And without further ado, um, I'm going to start um, by having Meredith Grimsley tell you about herself and her art practice. And if you have questions for the artists when they're done with their presentations, we will be asking them your questions. Um, if you can put the questions in the Q&A box and keep the chat for more sort of chatty kinds of things like all of the greetings, um, that makes it a lot easier for me to follow along and make sure that your question is one of the ones that the artists answer. So Meredith, take it away. Okay, um, I'm so thrilled to be here and I'm even more thrilled to be watching the chat and seeing that this audience is worldwide. So to say uh, good day, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, I, I feel like <laughs> I could, that covers it, I guess. So um, hello and uh, thank you so much for coming and a special thank you to Martha and Lucy uh, for organizing this wonderful event and including me. I'm humbled and honored. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I received my Master's of Fine Arts in 2002 in fabric design from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, USA, um, under the guidance of two wonderful artists, Ed Lambert and Glenn Kaufman. Uh, my work including wearable art, installation, performance, two-dimensional and three-dimensional design uh, forms has been shown in numerous national and international venues. Uh, in solo and group exhibitions. Um, I am currently a professor of fabric design at Bloomsburg University uh, of Pennsylvania. I'm also the chairperson of the art department there. Uh, and you can find me online at MeredithRayGrimsley.com. Um, the work I've included, oh, uh, Lucy, if you could go back one slide, yes, please. Uh, the work I've included in Ebb and Flow is pictured here. Uh, and you'll see that this is a departure from my other work I share because this piece is a specific response to my mother's diagnosis of vascular dementia and the changes that are ravaging her. My mother, who was once an amazing seamstress, has lost the physical skills it takes to cut and sew. But something lingers from her days of maneuvering fabric. She obsessively cuts at household fabrics, mostly washcloths and her own pants. I have made this quilt in an effort to find meaning in her new work and to reframe her bad days with this degenerative disease. The remainder of my presentation will be an overview of my work and my philosophy of making. Okay, now we can move on, Lucy, thank you. From the day we are born to the day we die, we are wrapped in fiber. It has been a second skin, ushered us into this world kept us warm, made us fashionable, embraced us in fear, love, memory, and nostalgia, adorned us in ceremony, ornamented the spaces we occupy, been passed down through families in heirloom and practice, and will usher us out when we pass from this world. Our interaction with textiles is the longest sustained physical relationship we have in our lives. Other than our own body, it is the only material that will always accompany us through life, disposable to sacred. Further, fiber art is made from materials which are perceived to be delicate or fragile. Yet, when a fiber artwork is made, the materials can withstand incredible physical manipulation, harsh chemical environments, extreme temperatures. It is beaten, stomped, tied, knotted, tangled, pierced with needles, and still remain strong or become stronger. This is simply awesome. I am moved by the metaphorical capabilities of fiber as an artistic medium and as a conduit to the subconscious. As a 45-year-old woman, what my work has given me at this point in my life is a deeply painful yet liberating perspective 
that I have labored under a personal fiction most of my life. My work reveals the veil of self-deception I have constructed over my depression and childhood trauma. As a coping mechanism for trauma, personally created fairy tales have clouded my vision and my ability to live in truth. As an artist, I correlate dysfunctional family legacies through both personal experiences and epigenetics to reveal the psychological genetic traits that each generation inherits. I see that within families, significant events, words and behaviors occur and are absorbed into our daily routine without examination. Some happen over time or in a breath. Our minds and bodies are formed. However, whatever residue embeds through nature and nurture, we have the opportunity to deconstruct those wounds and to reclaim our spiritual identity, our spiritual birthright. This reminds me of Ephesians 5, 13 through 14. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Now I find myself in eager pursuit of truth. To my audience, I whisper about my search with the physical indelible mark of the stitch and the language of fiber. Through my work, I am ushered into a radical acceptance of self-worth. I am given the gift to reconnect with the mysteries of life. Perfectly timed pain, confrontation of darkness, embracing true love, seeking forgiveness, practicing gratitude, nurturing friendships, the endurance of the human spirit, and accepting the gift of God's healing grace. The following words are not mine, but they call to me at every level of my life and work. Psalm 139, 1 through 3, 1 through 3 and 13 through 15. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And lastly, uh, Tepiwa Mugube's poem, You Are Oceanic. All she wanted was to find a place to stretch her bones and spread her hair, a place where her legs could walk without cutting and bruising, a place unchained. She was born out of the ocean breath. I reminded her, stop pouring so much of yourself into the hearts that have no room for themselves. Do not thin yourself, be vast. You do not bring the ocean to a river. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Caroline Groshen. So hello, and I send my greetings to all of you in this amazingly Zoom connected world of ours. And I give my thanks to Martha and Lucy and Sakwa for the opportunity to share my art. So the next quote, oh, thanks Lucy. Um, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and for 35 years I've had the great good fortune to be a quilter and a shibori dyer who mostly makes landscapes. Ebb and flow has so many interpretations, I was really happy that my more literal quilt was accepted. It's the turning of the tide when ebb becomes a flow, energetically goes back to the shore. Next. My quilts usually begin by drawing. By the way, that's me very younger out there. But anyway, I sit and try to capture the beauty of a place. But this quilt's image comes from a California State Park when I was teaching in Santa Barbara. And so there wasn't time to sit and draw, so my photo had to suffice. Next. Back in my studio, I draw and redraw, trying to internalize the image, I think, and to simplify what I drew, which I really need to do. So there wasn't time, um, I'm sorry, I also imagined the patterns and tried to bring the bands, landscape to life. 
and I have to figure out how much shibori I need to dye. The lower drawing is squared off, ready to take to a photocopier to enlarge to full scale. This is actually the closest I come to modern technology in my process. Next. Some of my quilts, like the wave, are whole cloth. That's when the top is one piece of fabric. You can see that top in the foreground and behind it is an enlarged detail. First, I penciled on the drawing to the top. I'd put the drawing on, I'd pencil it in. And then in this case, I added and painted a little bit of blue dye. Next comes the shibori. Areas that will be patterned, I've filled with stitches. Areas left empty will be flooded with the dye. Next. After the stitches are gathered tightly and knotted, that controls the dye, controls where it goes. So then indigo dyeing happens and that involves submerging the fabric for a couple of minutes and then airing it to oxidize on a line. The process is repeated to deepen the blues. And here it was done about 12 times actually. To air the dye, I stretch a line from that sink over there all the way to the filing cabinet next to my husband's computer. We share this room and thankfully, we're still happily married after over 50 years. Next. After dyeing and airing, the stitches are removed to reveal the design. This is the top then that comes out of the dye pot. I'm always, happening, happy, I'm always hoping for good results after all that stitching. I then sandwich the top with the usual batting and backing for a quilt. Next. The sewing happens in this room. I'm grateful in COVID times that my studio is at home. Nothing fancy since I only need a design wall and pins, needle and thread, scissors and thimble, maybe a ruler and tape, and sometimes a hoop. My sewing machine is only for binding and hanging sleeves. Next. Here's the finished quilt again. This and my other landscapes seem very straightforward, but there are subtexts that are important to me. And next, this is a detail. For me, landscapes mark time, day and night, the seasons, and of course, tides. This lets me stop time just for a moment in a way that counters our hectic pace, as does all that wonderful hand stitching that keeps me healthy. Next. I love celebrating our natural world that needs protection. I rarely create direct messages like the word melting in this map of the Arctic Circle. More often, it's a place I want to preserve like Walden Pond on the right, sharing good memories of places that often resonate with viewers. Next. My love of stitching has grown over the years. Stitch Shibori offers endless opportunities. Even after creating the samples for teaching, I'm still finding new ways to sew and dye stitched patterns. Next. I'm also indulging my passion for hand stitching in pieced quilts. Here I applique and quilt simultaneously by hand directly right into batting and backing, leaving the edges raw. A few dots of glue may temporarily hold the pieces in place before I sew them down, but there are no fusibles. And it's a detail, the, on the right is a detail of this quilt. Next. More and more I'm smitten with the energetic stitchery of Boro, the Japanese tradition of mending by hand. It has influenced my work, including a series on water lilies. I'm also excited about dyeing indigo over fiber reactive color, which creates lovely, lovely halos. Next. And recently, I've turned back to reading poetry, which seems comforting in our times. This quilt is inspired by Boro and a haiku by Basho, another tide flowing. It goes, harvest moon, the sea rises, almost to my door. And here's a detail. So I thank you for listening. And now I'd like to introduce Marissa. Hi everybody, thank you very much for coming uh, to listen to us. I want to thank Martha and Lucy and Sakwa for this opportunity. My name is Marisa Market and I'm original from Spain. About two years ago, I moved with my husband and my son to Illinois. 
I used to own with my family in Spain, my own sewing machine business and quilt shop. And that is how I started on the work of quilting. I start quilting as a necessity to help both sales and classes for the quilt shop. In doing so, I realized that I was quickly become a hobby and a passion. My first quilts were based on traditional blocks and patterns. I did not start experience with our quilt until 2012. Next. My quilt from Ebb and Flow is called Brain Overflow. I love exhibits with a specific theme. The idea for this quilt came after watching a TV program about social media addiction. All the useless and potential fake or unfounded information that pours in our brains without filter. This information accumulates and blocks the intake of the real knowledge. Next. I'm a fan of steampunk elements and I use them in my work whenever I have a chance, like for example here, the pipes. Next. I, start, I started having to learn to quilt when there was not too many people that they were machine quilting in Spain. You have to think that we do not have a traditional in quilting in my country, and it's something that we imported from other countries, especially the United States. The first time that I machine quilted was in a normal sewing machine, and of course, it was a queen size bed quilt, and it was a horrible experience, but I got hooked. My quilt dance took place many years after that first experience. Every quilt for me is a new learning experience. As this was my first whole cloth quilt, I learned a lot about what not to do. The inspiration of this work is from the dreams that we have as a kids and as we grow old, we leave behind. Next. Since I do not have any artistic background, I do not know how to draw either. My designs are a mix of images from copyright free sources, then modified on Photoshop to fit my ideas. Next. As I said before, I love exhibits with a specific themes. Imagine Das was exhibited in San Marisa's Mines in 2015. This was my first true international exhibit. The subject was Imagine. After discarding the first typical ideas, I developed this quilt. I wanted to include the steampunk that I love and something with a Victorian vibe, yet modern and industrial. Next. The industrial, the industrial bricks are all hand applique and machine quilted. This was my interpretation of the Magritte paint scent of a man. I mix techniques, hand applique, machine quilting, painting, whatever it fits to that quilt. Next. There are not too many occasions when I do, I do something without an exhibit in mind. Loss inherence is one of those. While well, the world was watching the destruction of a Syrian's art in the hands of terrorists, I decided that I needed to put something on fabric to show support to the plates of the artifacts. My proud warrior emerged from stone to fabric. This was the first time that I print on fabric. The printed background are pre-Christian languages and the Assyrian is applique and quilted with frapunto. Next. You can see in the, image, in the image some part of the printing and a detail of the bear, of the beard. Next. These two quilts were selected by Susan Millen Jones for the traveling exhibits Fly Me to the Moon and also published in a book of the same title. The first quilt is named He is Looking at You Kid and is a mix of applique and painting. Inspiration is based on the famous images of an astronaut on the moon landing, but I wanted to give it a twist by actually having the reflection of the moon in his visor. So and truly how small and vulnerable we all are. Next, the second one, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a detail of the painting on the moon on the visor. Next. 
The second one is called Verne's Moon and is applique painting and machine quilting. Again, inspiration came from one of my favorite authors, Jules Verne, and his futuristic vision. He is represented by standing on the moon, and also my love is steampunk is included. Next. From time to time, I like to return to work on whole cloth. As I, no, as I no longer have too much time to do piecing quilts anymore, I thought of making a long star quilt, but using Yun Li thread. Since moving to the Midwest and with a change of scenery from the cityscape of Madrid to the farm fields of rural Illinois, even though we are in Chicago, as we have Chicago as a backdrop, I decide in this quilt to go for farmhouse country chic look. Next. And of course, this will be probably the only Lone Star quilt that I will ever make. Here you have some details of the chair. Next. My last quilt today is called Alsace. This was my first totally printed quilt. During one of my trips to Alsace, France, while walking through the beautiful towns, I would take photographs, you know, just the typical side scenes. It wasn't until later, looking through the images, that I came across the photo of wine bottles, and I decided to experiment with Photoshop and print it on the photo on my home printer machine. Next. Loving the way it came out, I just have simply, simply to put along the outlines. Thank you very much. And I want to introduce Lini Sheman. Hi, greetings from London. I'm Lynn Seaman, and I want to thank all of you for coming and watching this presentation. Also, I'd like to thank Martha and Lucy and all the people at SAQWA. I've been a member of SAQWA since 2000. Um, I am a former French teacher, but uh, that was before I discovered art quilts in 1998. The theme of all my work is color. I love bright colors and they are the starting point for all of my work. Much of my work is inspired by the natural world and usually I make abstract landscapes. I strive to bring a sense of joy, beauty and tranquility to all of my quilts. You can find my quilts on my website, fabricoflife.co.uk. Next please. This is my ebb and flow quilt, A Year in the Forest, part of my forest series. As in most of my work, the background is a single piece of hand dyed fabric. The trees and leaves are fused onto the background after quilting the lines representing the trees. The kanji characters I wrote represent the four seasons beginning at the top with spring. To me, trees are a metaphor for life both human and in the natural world. I'm constantly fascinated by the colors of the changing seasons, the ebb and flow of the seasons give a reassuring continuity. Next please. This is the Forest Autumn, made in 2020 as part of my forest series. Autumn is my favorite season with the crisp days and cool nights and the ephemeral splendor of color everywhere. This quilt and four others of mine have been acquired by the International Quilt Museum, part of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which has the largest museum collection of quilts in the world. Next, please. This is Forest Sunrise. This quilt was made for the Invitational Exhibition 75 a celebration of new work in fiber at the Dairy Art Center in Boulder, Colorado in 2017. My trees have now turned into sticks, abstracting the form of the trees. Next, please. This is Jacaranda, Memories of Northern Queensland. 
I made it in 2019, inspired by a trip to Australia two years previously. We spent a week in Port Douglas, northern Queensland, seeing the Great Barrier Reef, the rainforest, and the jacaranda trees which were blooming there. Next, please. This is River Forest 2019. This was a commission similar to Forest Sunrise, but with the sparkling stitched river running through it. Next, please. This is Purple Mountains Majesty, inspired by Front Range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. As I traveled from London heading west, I followed the sun all the way to Colorado, making it, for me, a 31-hour day. The quote is from a photograph I took on that first evening in Boulder, Colorado. Next. This is Good Vibrations number two, made in 2020 as part of my isolation art series and a circles series. Inspired by a visit to Paris where I saw very large circle paintings by Sonia and Robert Delaunay. Each circle quilt has to be drawn out full size. This one is 30 by 36. And then the pieces have to be traced onto parchment paper before ironing the fabric onto fusible web, then cutting out the circle and placing it on the, on the, the background of the quilt, which is on my design wall. It's a very complicated technique. Next, please. This is Good Vibrations number five. This is a work in progress. I kind of hesitated on showing this because it's not completely finished. Uh, the pieces are all there, but I haven't added the stitching yet. I wanted to surprise viewers by doing something completely out of my comfort zone, um, which is brightly colored pieces. So I decided to make a quilt with only black and white. But as I was making it, I succumbed to the beauty of color and I added a few pieces of red. Next, please. Lines. This was made in 2020 as part of my isolation art series. Wanting to simplify my quilts, I decided that the combination of colors and stitch would be the main focus of this series of quilts based on straight lines. Next, please. In my home studio, I have a large IKEA wardrobe with drawers. Color is the basis of all of my work. This drawer holds a fabric I used in almost every one of my quilts. It's hand dyed cotton by Heidi Stolweber, a German master dyer and quilt artist. Next. My home studio is in a former bedroom in my house in London. I have a beautiful view of my back garden and, or backyard while I'm sewing. The quilt that's getting ready to be sewn is called Seed Pod. Next. This is my main work table, which is two meters by one meter. Work on the wall above my collection of Mexican wooden folk art animals is called Impossadillo and was in a juried memorial exhibition for Yvonne Priscilla called Live Your Brightest Life. Pieces from other artists are also displayed. Next. My studio work table and design wall. On the design wall is the newest of pieces in my lines series. The working title is Sea and Sky. Next, please. The garden studio is a purpose-built building at the end of my back garden where I use wet media. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you for watching. There are more quilts on my website, fabricofbluff.co.uk. And I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Marisa. Thanks, Carol Ann. Thanks, Meredith. Um, if you can all turn your video cameras back on, uh, we will start to answer some of the many questions that we've been getting from the audience. By the way, um, just for um, information, we had a uh, 
a high of 535 people here enjoying this textile talk, which is just so wonderful. Um, somebody's been asking for the artists' websites. Um, if we don't have an opportunity to post that right now, we will send it out when you get an email saying that the recording of this textile talk is available online and um, asking if you're interested in uh, registering for next week's textile talk, which will be Kay Facet and Aaron Lee Gefill, a creative conversation put on by the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Um, so we definitely um, will get those to you if we don't um, manage to post them in the chat right now. Um, so I have questions uh, right now and we'll um, do a couple per artist and then we'll circle back around for a second uh, set. Meredith, um, your work, except for the piece about your mother's dementia, seems to be almost entirely self-portraits. Can you talk a little bit about that, about why that's the subject that you keep returning to and whether that's difficult to put yourself on display like that? Um, well, I will say that um, this particular group of work that I, I put out there, um, some of it is self-portrait, some of it is also um, what I call my muse, which is a photograph of my great, great, multiple great aunt, who was a farm worker uh, in Georgia um, many, many years ago. And I have an old photograph of her and it, it's always inspired me because she just seems so like such a boss. She's awesome. Um, so the, yeah, I think um, a lot of this work is self-portrait because of what I talked about, this kind of uh, self-reflection that has come from my 30s and 40s and uh, my newer work which um, you know is happening in progress right now like out of view um, and piles on my table is uh, is less self self-referential um, I, I just think it was it's kind of the stage of life I'm going through and I think in some ways this this work kind of allowed me to let go of some things. And now uh, I can kind of look outward a little bit more. And, uh, and of course, with my mother's condition, that's, that's been a real uh, uh, startling part of my reality is, is uh, the prospect of losing her. So. Um, sure. Yeah, one of the questions from the audience was, um, do you feel like your mother's dementia has altered your sense of, you made a reference to living through a fairy tale. Um, it's funny, I, I've done a lot of um, personal work, psychological work uh, through um, some traumatic events that, have, that took place as a child. And uh, I think in some ways, some of that fairy tale was, was also promoted by my family. Um, so I, I didn't, think of it all by myself. So I, I had done some of that work personally uh, before her diagnosis. And a friend of mine put it really beautifully. She said, wow, as soon as you didn't need her, she wasn't there. So uh, mm -hmm. in a way, I had already grieved what I thought was an image of my mom and uh, had begun to accept her as who she is. And that's been really helpful in learning how to accept her in this new way, like who she's becoming. It's, it's quite mm -hmm. startling. And it's also a gift to know her uh, through this process. So. Uh, one, of, one of the comments was that um, your art is incredibly brave. Yeah, um, and um, there there was um, a question. You quoted a poem. Yes. And somebody wanted to know what was the poem's title and the author. Yes, I I wrote it down as I as I saw that pop up on the chat. So the author, uh, his name is Tapiwa Mugube, and that's spelled T A P I W A. That's the first name. Uh, Mugabe, I'm, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correct, uh, M-U-G-A-B-E, so M-U-G-A-B-E, and the poem is You Are Oceanic, 
and it's from his book, Zimbabwe. You can find it on Amazon or other booksellers, but uh, the book, it comes from Zimbabwe, and I highly recommend the book. Oh, that poem is yeah, particularly beautiful. beautiful. Um, Carol Ann, we're going to switch to, they want to know about technique. Right. Um, so the first question um, that just popped up was, um, when you're doing indigo, are you using a natural indigo or a synthetic indigo? I kind of figured um, that would be uh, one of the questions. So um, yes, I use synthetic indigo, though I have experienced natural. And the summer I grew a pot of indigo for the first time. So, um, and I extracted about a tablespoon of indigo out of that pot. So I have, I, I really understand the current, um, how everybody now really likes the idea of natural dyeing, it has great good reasons behind it. But over the years, I've used synthetic indigo because it's, it's concentrated, it's reliable, it has been uh, more available. And so I do, I, I also do very small dye pots. My process is interesting because I create all the shibori I need for a quilt that I can do. And then it comes down very small. So I can use a pretty small dye pot, I dye the fabric, use up the rest of the indigo with the backing, usually, and then I'm done with it because my long road, I'm down that long road to finish the, go from white fabric down to constructed quilt. So mm -hmm. the indigo is just a one small step of the whole thing. So, so well, I know the, I the other question that um, came up was why use indigo rather than an MX dye, which you can get the indigo color from, with le without needing to do multiple dippings and, and airings yeah. and et cetera? Well, I, I kind of think indigo is easy. And, and that's because you set up one dye pot, you've got it there, you're using it for a couple of days, you don't have to dump it and rinse it like you do. You, the fiber reactive uses up faster. But I also think that indigo has a really special relationship with shibori. Right. And it's partly that when it absorbs in to that point of pressure that you put on the fabric by tying it or sewing it or whatever. Um, it comes in kind of courteously. It doesn't rush in like some of the dyes, right? Some of them just fly in and it's harder to control, I think. So I really like, and I also think indigo is good for my soul. You have to calm down to use it. You don't want to splash oxygen in it. You do the rhythm of the submerging with hands quietly in an indigo vat and then airing it and you repeat that rhythm so there's a piece of that that's that's a good contribution i think so mm -hmm. a lot of reasons yeah well that actually segues into one of the questions that i wrote down which is you mentioned how you feel that what you are doing is a metaphor for time passing and that you're trying to stop time or capture time or pause right. time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I just think that everything goes so fast. And by watching day to night, it's all the natural world that marks our time. It's, it's a big, big clock for us, I think. And so um, it really makes me appreciate the changes and then being able to capture that kind of moment. It just feels, it feels like I can slow things down. Same thing mm -hmm. with all the hand sewing. It just right. takes you down a notch and you're just not rushing. So it's, it, it, it's something that I think, I don't know, I think it's an antidote to things moving too fast, I guess. Mm -hmm. Marisa. Um, a lot of the questions had to do with steampunk. People <laughs> want to know, do you dress steampunk? Do you read steampunk? What's the fascination with steampunk all about? Well, I think that is the mix of old and new. You know, it's kind of like 1800 style, but it's kind of like with a twist, uh, with machinery. And, you know, I think that it has such a particular and a special um, flavor is something completely different. So, um, and I like that old flavor, all that the dresses, the, the style. I don't dress as much as I will. Um, 
but I do have some accessories and things that I do uh, love steampunk and I use it as much as I can. And I do read a lot because there is, I love juvenile uh, literature and there's a lot of uh, books in that area. So I, I do read anytime that I can. <laughs> um, the other uh, question which um, I had uh, thought about when you were doing your practice session, it was less clear in this version, is you mentioned that when you're designing something, especially for a challenge, which you really enjoyed doing the challenges, you said that you always throw out your first idea. So can you talk a little bit about that and how do you know when you've thought of the right idea? Um, okay, usually when I get a theme for uh, an exposition a show, um, I love using it. Uh, so what I usually always do is first I look the word in the dictionary because even if I know the meaning of the word, there is always something that maybe I didn't think about it. Then I usually research to see what painting, what books, uh, what other quotes they have been done with the same subject. So in one way not to do the same thing and another thing another time is to see what other artists have interpreted that theme. Then usually I get the first idea that is the majority of the times where everybody thought like in the imagine that the subject it was imagine everybody thinks about John Lennon and the song. So I didn't want to go in that direction. So I try always to do kind of like a little bit of a twist. Um, and I start drawing. I don't know how to draw, but I just do just some doodles in paper to see, to, to get that idea. I write a lot of words, words that they will mean, just something that they will bring that. So sometimes it's kind of like a change from one word, I get to another word, another word, another idea, until I'm happy, kind of like I get an obsession with, with an idea. And that's how I know that is the right one. Um, Sometimes it's really, really far away from the theme, but another times it's really close. So it's kind of like with imagine that it's just kind of like the light bulb, <laughs> <laughs> like light up. Mm -hmm. and say, well, this is it. So, so that's how I usually work. Thank you. Yeah, um, wonderful, different ideas for each of the challenges you shared with us. Lynn, we're going to go to you. You clearly do dress to match your art. <laughs> um, and um, all of your, your work, uh, except for that most recent black and white piece, it, it uses those very richly saturated colors. Yeah. Um, yes. One of the questions was, would you say again, who the hand dye artist is that you, whose fabrics you use? Her name is Haida Stoll Weber, H-E-I-D-E-S-T-O-L-L-W-E-B-E-R. Uh, -E -E and she lives in Frankfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier this year, I ran out of certain colors of her fabric because she hasn't come to the UK for two years now. Although I did by two years worth of fabric the last time I saw her. Uh, I, I sent her some swatches and bless her. She, she said, I'm not dyeing a lot of fabric at the moment because there's no place, you know, there aren't any shows open anymore. Mm. So uh, she just, she got this from her, her stash and sent it to me. And I got 15 meters of beautiful fabric. Mm -hmm. You also said that you dye paint some of the fabrics you use for the background, and people were wondering what you used to do that process. Okay, the behind me is a quilt that is completely hand painted, and um, I use Dynaflow silk paint. It's uh, it is a dye, and it is absorbed into the fabric. It's not like paint; it doesn't just sit on the top. Um, and I, I, I paint, I have painted a lot of fabric in the past. Um, and so when I was starting to run out of fabric and also locked in, um, I, I started to go back through my stash or to paint new fabrics. Mm -hmm. So, so I did a lot of that to use, uh, 
when I didn't have the right color, when I wanted, uh, for instance, a technique that Haida doesn't do, like like stripes or you know fading from one color to another to another to another. Um, so and and I I love Dynaflow. I uh, I I used to be in my in my days when I was painting more. I used to be the Dynaflow queen. <laughs> Wonderful. Meredith, all right, we have a couple more questions about um, technique. Um, you do a fair amount of printing, and there were questions asking what kind of printing techniques you use. Oh, I do um, silkscreen, so photo emulsion silkscreen. Uh, I also have done some digital printing on fabric. Uh, and some imagery that looks printed, sometimes uh, people mistake it, especially in, you know, digital format. Uh, I actually draw and stitch images. Um, so a lot of times I'll use, uh, from my sketchbook, I'll take photographs and project with a digital projector and trace onto my uh, quilt tops and, and then stitch from there. Mm -hmm. Some of your work, which was not included in the slideshow that I've always found fascinating, uses a lot of um, loose threads. That can, well, one piece you showed that did that with the two people facing each other with the threads in between. Um, what kind of thread are you using to do that that is strong enough to um, be transported, but um, you know has that wonderful connecting connectivity quality to it? Well, the one piece that was in this um, uh, slideshow, it was actually a piece of organza. So it was, it was silk organza that was dyed and printed. Um, but I, I am not a fancy thread person. I'm actually still learning about thread. I've just learned about superior threads and I feel like I've fallen down a rabbit hole and I just have all <laughs> these threads that I look at a lot I'm not using yet. I just am admiring them. But so a lot of the pieces that you're referring to, in fact, I have one right here that's got some threads you can see hanging. That's just good old Coates and Clark. And okay. that's a piece that I made before my children were born. And I actually braided the thread. This is okay. when I had All this. Right. Well, I didn't well. realize the endless time <laughs> that I had before these two boys entered my life. But uh, yeah, so <laughs> nothing mm -hmm. exciting. Just, uh, just that now I'm getting excited about threads. So. Mm -hmm. joining the club. I guess. Well, Carolyn Grotrian, what kind of thread are you using to do your shibori? Oh, sure. Um, if I'm doing stitched shibori, I don't want it to break. So, I mean, I know there are people who can do, there are teachers who, t I, one class I took did that she was doing this wonderful, like almost French lingerie sewing with the shibori and pulling it gently. I'm, I want to pull it, make sure it's not going to break. And so I usually use an, an upholstery thread, like okay. a, a nylon, but at Coates and Clark's, um, mm. the craft thread that's cotton co uh, covered poly. So something just really pretty sturdy. It's mm. no fun when it breaks. No, <laughs> especially when you've got these like I, I would, behind, yeah. I mean, just rows of long stitching in it. No, you don't want to lose it. No. <laughs> do Do you ever leave the fabric all gathered together, or do you always release it? I release it, but what's amazing is people want to touch it because it still looks three dimensional almost, even if I've flattened it out. Um, it doesn't, if, if you keep it bunched up, unless you leave the stitches in, it doesn't keep its shape unless you're willing to mess with polyester. Because if you do it with polyester, you'll change the molecular structure of the synthetic and it, the plastics will reform. And I just, I really don't go there. So mm -hmm. it's fun, but I, not in my work. Not, not for you. No, no, I'm a natural kind of girl. <laughs> <laughs> Marisa, um, how do you decide when you're going to create your design with stitch, with paint, with printing? You, you use a lot of different techniques. How do you choose which one is what you want? Well, a lot of times it's um, the will tell me. You know, I know that sounds crazy, but um, I'm... <laughs> Meredith agree with that. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it, there is sometimes that it makes sense to use uh, an applique. And other times what I usually do is I paint the design and then applique it. I 
paint, I don't paint on the surface of the quilt. I work in separate areas. And then I, I mix everything. Sometimes I don't like what I paint. Uh, I redo it or I decide to do it with thread because I wanted to have the texture. And I like to have the dimension. Sometimes the applique and then the thread is going to give me more dimension than sure. if I just do everything in one area. I use a lot of thread. Um, I love thread. You know, I just um, collect them. <laughs> I use <laughs> a lot of thread. Uh, so I try, you know, different things. It will depend, it's sometimes, it's, it's, it will depend on the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question goes to Lynn. Um, you showed work from a couple of different series. You yeah. showed ones that are based on trees or sticks. You showed one that was just squares with lines of quilting and you showed some of your circles. Do you switch back and forth? Or do you work through one series and then suddenly decide enough with lines, I'm doing circles? That's exactly it, yes. I, 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 I've been doing my forest series for more than 10 years. And I came to the place uh, when, at, when we were locked in and I thought, I think I have said everything I want to say now about mm -hmm. trees and natural world. So I spoke to my husband and he, he said, why are you always using straight lines? Why don't you use circles? So I thought, ah, oh, yes, that's a very good thing. So I researched circles and that's how that series came about. There are six of them at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I will go back to them, but I may. Um, but I'm trying, I'm always trying to simplify my images and um, use fewer colors. Um, what I really love to do is to create work that if you see it from a distance, it looks one way, but if you come closer, you see the nuances in it. And it, then it, it tells you a little bit more of what, what I am trying to say. Um, and I don't, I don't pretend to have um, a lot to say, but I, I do want to evoke emotions uh, in people who are viewing my quilts. And I just hope that the bright colors sometimes will make them feel happy. They certainly make me feel happy. No, oh, they're, thank they're you. <laughs> just, just, you know, cheery. You know, it, it's like it's a good day at Lynn's house every day. <laughs> it is. It is. Yes. Even though my husband and I have been locked in together now for seven months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, we're, and we're still speaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I want to thank all four of you so much for sharing your work. Um, for the audience, um, we're going to show the full uh, art from the ebb and flow exhibit so don't sign off quite yet also lucy if you can switch there we go um i want to um tell everybody that ebb and flow was originally supposed to premiere at the international quilt festival in houston which sadly had to be canceled. So we have interviewed all of the artists from Ebb and Flow and those interviews where the artist is talking in depth about their work are going to be posted onto our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and look for Sakwa Art, you will find those um, those interviews and I've got the official instructions right here. If you go to YouTube and find Sakwa art and look for this, the Sakwa logo that has the turquoise letter to find them, and you subscribe and click the bell button as we post them, you'll get a notification so you don't miss any of them as they go up. Um, so please do check out the YouTube. Also, um, I hope you've enjoyed today's textile talk. We are doing them every week, um, except right at the holidays. Um, and you can find all of the information. You can register for next week's textile talks. 
You can also find a full listing of the recordings of the textile talks there. Um, this talk was being recorded and will be put up um, both on the website and on YouTube in just a couple of days. So if you want to share it with your friends, family, uh, hairdresser, whomever, um, just send them to sakwa.com slash textile talks. And now Lucy is going to start the slideshow of the art from Ebb and Flow. Thank you so much for being here today.